Hi, everybody. It's Michelangelo Caruso. It's time for another Talk to Me podcast. I'm with my buddy, Marshall Butler, who I'm, I'm jealous of you for many reasons, Marshall, but the big one is you're in Florida. I'm not sure about being in Florida today is a, is a huge benefit. It was uh, 36 degrees this morning with a windshield of 28. So it was a little, little brisk when I went for my run, but um, it, uh, that's first, probably the first cold day of this uh, winter. So you know, I'm in uh, Detroit. Been, it's been, it's, I know it's been in the 60s and 70s. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, I can't imagine being in Detroit. <laughs> Most of the time we joke about Michigan being the opposite of Florida. Yeah. Uh, I'm also jealous because you have a, a really keen sense of uh, production quality, a phrase that many people are becoming more familiar with during COVID because we're being forced to be our best and show ourselves in electronic settings. And man, I mean, I came up through the music business, so I know a little bit about lighting and sound and production values and stuff, but I was just astounded at how, and this, this is the polite way of saying it, people are ignorant about <laughs> technology, man. It's, yeah, it's, um, you know, I, I, when I, I started out in, um, you know, kind of growing up. Uh, playing with technology all through high school and college and uh, kind of was the AV geek. And I guess uh, as I started uh, going up in the ranks of Rotary, attending some events and just uh, seeing what people would do and, and what they were satisfied with doing. And it was just kind of disappointing that, you know, you take a weekend out of your, out of your, uh, out, of, out of the month and you go to these events and the production quality of a lot of these were just, they're pretty, pretty poor. Yeah. Um, I remember attending one and, and, and we're waiting for the next presentation to come up and you can actually on the screens, they have giant dual screens on either side of the, of the stage and you can see someone on their desktop trying to find the PowerPoint to put it, put it up there. And I thought, <laughs> yeah. my gosh, we can do better than this. And, you know, I've, I've, I've participated in some events and they have switchers and stuff like that. And they tried to mitigate some of that behind the scenes stuff, but, um, it, it, it really is disappointing to see that some folks are okay with just not providing that great experience that we think or we know that people deserve if they go to one of these events. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we started, I started by talking about how this is a, a kind of technology ignorance, but I think, I think if we were to be fair, let me adjust my seat here. I think if we were to be fair, it's, it's more accurately a, a lack of awareness um, because you mentioned uh, seeing some, a computer desktop on a screen, you know, 300 people in a room waiting for a, 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 a high-end speaker to start their program, and That's they're right. trying to find the PowerPoint presentation somehow. <laughs> um, but if you looked at the stage itself, you'd see cardboard boxes and the, the, the sign on the podium's tilted, and nobody's doing this kind of um, QC or quality control. I was at a restaurant one time uh, on the circuit, and uh, and this is the very first time I, I, I tripped on this term. There was a, a guy with a, a clean rag and a tongs, you know, like a kitchen tongs. Yeah. And he was touching every plate that came off the food line before the servers got it to bring to the tables. And this guy was the hardest working guy in the restaurant. And you could see it because it was kind of an open kitchen. And I just became, I was with somebody else, but I couldn't take my eyes off this guy. Who is this guy? He's got to have a title. What does this guy do? And I found out he's called an expediter. Did you know that term? Did not know that term, no. He's like the QC person of the restaurant. So he's huh. taking off all the unsightly French fries. He's wiping the rim of the plate. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah. it turns out the chef doesn't give a crap what the plate looks <laughs> like when he's shoving it out. It's That's the right. expediter's job to fix it. And we know That's the right. presentation is really important, not only in the restaurant business, but in the, in the event planning business. So it's more than just tech, it's, it's so many other things. And I think, I think your example is a great one, you know, that, that we're looking at computer desktops or we have dead air is another one, a pet peeve of mine. That's I right. should mention, uh, Marshall mentioned Rotary a second ago. Marshall Butler is the, uh, what's called a Rotary Public Image Coordinator for Zone 34 in the Rotary world. Now Zone 34 is Marshall, Florida, Georgia and the Caribbean, correct? That's right. And I am, uh, for those of you that don't know, Marshall's counterpart in Zone 28. Now, for various reasons, I'm a co-coordinator this year. Next year, I'll be the full-on uh, RPIC, we're called. Mm -hmm. So we're kindred spirits in that way. And that's why I wanted to talk with you today and give people some real 
advice, not just general advice, but very specific things they can watch for if they wanted to take their events to another level. And we know in any organization, this is really important, especially in an organization that wants to grow members because the quality event of the event can determine how many people comes to the, come to the next event. That's right. And it can also determine uh, the buzz that you get out of the event, uh, not necessarily even the next event, but you know, with a lot of these uh, events now being virtual, um, we're allowed, you know, we record these. And so it, if people are talking about it and buzzing about it, um, we can drive them to go watch the recordings. And again, uh, that's another way to amplify the impact of that event and possibly it's a lead generation tool to bring in other new members. That's right. I mean, it sets a tone, right? It's like, um, it's like getting dressed in the morning, everybody. If you, if you care enough to put on clean press clothes and comb your hair, when you hold an event, you, you want those, those kinds of analogous attributes at your event. You want a good clean room, nice temperature, no microphone squeals. You want, you want a program that runs with a, a minute by minute script. And we're gonna get into some of these terms and, and how you can pull this off at your next zone meeting if you're in Rotary or assembly or a district conference, whatever. That's right. Let's talk quickly about, uh, we'll play a little badminton here. I'll hit the, hit the badminton, the, the little thing, the birdie over the net, you hit it back yeah. to me. Uh, how do we know we're at a bad event, Marshall? You had mentioned um, seeing the computer desktop on the screen, which is a no-no. I had mentioned cardboard visible at, because everybody's taking pictures of the speaker and you can see all this shit in the background. I'm like, bloody hell people, don't you have, a, don't you have any self-respect? That's right. What's another thing for you that just makes this, the, the fur on the back of your neck go up. Uh, you know, I, I think it's important to do some rehearsals leading into some of these events. Um, <laughs> if you can, I mean, I, make sure that the speaker uh, knows to have good lighting and, and have the camera set correctly and knows how when it's their turn to have that share screen ready to go. So there again, it's the analogous to the desktop on the big screen. Make sure you got the right monitor picked. So once they flip it over to you to share the screen, boom, it's on there. I, too often yeah. I, I see people trying to figure out, well, is, is this screen or this screen? Yeah. Uh, be ready for that because it, a lot of that is just, you know, we, we as we prepare for these virtual events, we tell folks um, other things to uh, make sure you turn off any syncing applications like Dropbox or anything that's going to make noise. It's those little details that can really cause a distraction or reduce the video quality or the audio quality that can, again, just wreck an event. So yeah. it's paying attention to all those little details that you, you may not even think about, but you know, we make checklists of these, you know, make sure you do this and do this and, yeah. and I just pay attention to the details. You know, I, I teach uh, presentation skills and I always uh, tell everybody, I'm going to teach you how to do the perfect presentation because, and they're like, Oh, great. Cause my last presentation was far from perfect. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, you know, it's a really helpful tool when you're trying to be perfect is a checklist. Because if you do everything, if the checklist is good and you do everything that's on the checklist, you have a perfect presentation. That's and, right. and so often we're winging it. I can't tell you how many people, Marshall, want to do a TED Talk and they don't realize how much, to use your word, practice goes into a good TED Talk. Not only did the speaker practice beforehand, they actually do sessions where they practice playing to the various cameras in the room because it's usually a multi-camera shoot. Right. So how about practicing with the teleprompter so it doesn't look like you're reading this thing, you know? And how about practicing uh, eye contact with the audience and who's coaching the speakers on this stuff, if anybody? That's right. And, you know, that's funny that you mentioned TED Talk because as we were preparing for this most recent event, this uh, the, the Zone Summit, uh, we talked about uh, watching TED Talks and pay attention to how people give a TED Talk and how you even when people are in person, but even when you watch the YouTube recordings of the TED Talks after the fact, um, people come through the screen. And so, you know, you got to bring that energy because sometimes a two-dimensional medium like video, it's hard to come through the screen. And we tell people, you just, you got to amp up that energy so that you can really drive home what you're talking about instead of just kind of sitting there and talking about, you know, we're doing this and this yep. is a great project. So um, yeah, it's the practice and it's really, you know, bringing the energy uh, to, to deliver. When you talk about coming through the screen, are you referring to uh, some graphic people call it um, making it pop? You're talking about this, this, this um, vibrant uh, human type of presence on camera, right? 
that's it. Yeah. I, I, you know, I want people to feel like, I mean, obviously they're not in the same room, but I want them to feel like, you know, I'm there with Marshall right now because he is passionate about what he's talking about yeah. and just coming right through that camera uh, instead of just monotone delivery. And it's so important, especially with a, again, with a medium like video, uh, because we don't have those other, uh, you know, that, that proximity to the person. And so it's, it's important that we, we bring the energy through the screen. Right. I, uh, I tell speakers to appear lifelike <laughs> whenever possible. <laughs> tell me more about this, um, your use of music. People are using music a lot. They, they, they know in their heart, they know intuitively that music is good for events, but they mess it up in so many ways. You, do you have a pet peeve about music? You know, um, you got to be really careful with music because uh, if you're going to be streaming or putting it online, you can you, you can get in trouble with the copyright owners. So uh, especially in part of the broadcast, um, we do some we may use some high energy music leading up to it um, that we don't include in the final broadcast that goes out uh, or, or is saved to YouTube. But um, when we're doing live events, you know, um, in, in giant ballrooms, we we always make sure that. I, you know, again, going back to some of the Rotary experience, uh, Rotary is a, a multi-generational organization. I mean, we got, uh, you know, we got really young folks and we got some really old folks. And so um, we put together a pop playlist of music that crosses all those genres. But if you can think of all the great songs that have high energy across all those, we put those in a playlist as people are coming into the ballroom for one of the plenary sessions. And I know that I've done my job if I'm in the back of the room and I see people dancing and getting ready and getting excited because if they're coming into the room and you're feeding them energy as they prepare for this, uh, they're going to be ready to absorb whatever that speaker is going to be delivering instead of just coming in, you know, walking to their, again, it's, it's, it's about bringing the energy, going, sitting down, having a couple of words and then listening to someone. If we can start from the very beginning and bring that energy level up high using uh, really high energy music, uh, we've we've actually we've we've helped the speaker because now that that audience is going to be more receptive and and ready to receive whatever they're about to present. That's right. Um, I came up through the music business, so I love music and I love when it's used well. I mentioned at the start of the program that that a lot of this isn't so much about technology, it's about general awareness, because tech can be learned, especially now, a lot of the tools are so intuitive. And we'll get into tech in a minute, everybody to, uh, so we don't leave you in the dark on this stuff. But um, some, some months ago, maybe a couple years ago, people got enamored with this thing called walk on music, especially at physical events. Um, but but they, they didn't think about like if the podium's only like 10 feet from where the person's coming on stage, you can only play a few bars of music and then the person's standing there just waiting for the song to stop and that's awkward. So they ended up pulling the song after only a few bars and then the audience didn't even know what song it was sometimes because it never even got to the theme, you know, right. lyrical theme. So it's little stuff like that. Like what they do at the Academy Awards is they set the podium way far away from where the, uh, the actor or actress starts to walk because they want it to be 20 seconds. I mean, that's the level of awareness that we're talking about here. And that's exactly it. And uh, typically when we're doing walk on music for a lot of these events, we'll find that perfect 15 to 20 seconds in that song and, and make sure that, that, that we that's deliver right. that. And um, yeah, but you're right. Sometimes uh, there have been a couple of occasions where when someone did get there, but um, I, I've seen some really great speakers that kind of use that to, to amp up the crowd again, again, use it to their benefit to, to really make sure the crowd is uh, excited and ready to go. Yeah. Um, so we've talked about a, a few things that uh, indicate we're at a bad event. You did a zone event for your um, zone a few weeks ago, and I read about it all over on the internet. Lots of compliments, lots of, there was one guy in particular that thinks you're like some kind of tech god, good for you. Yeah. Um, how do you know when you're at a really good event? What are you seeing technically? And, and we can talk about this without leaving anybody uh, in the dark. What are you seeing as a technical person? And you go, wow, this is impressive. These people know what they're doing. Does anything jump to mind? Um, I think, you know, we talked about how dead air is a pet peeve and seeing some of the behind the scenes. I think if you can make it very seamless and just roll from one part to another, 
um, that's what I'm looking for is I'm looking for just a, a, a continuous delivery of program. Yep. And, uh, and we work hard uh, to make sure that, you know, again, going to the technology, we have some technology on the back end using some switchers and stuff like that, that we use to make sure things are queued up, things are ready to go. You yep. mentioned the, the minute by minute script. Uh, we make sure that all that is ready because you can tell if, um, if, if people have done that sort of work, because it's just, it's, it's a constant flow of, of, um, uh, production yeah. of, um, of, 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 of the program. Yeah. It's like a, a, a TV show. You've mentioned the term switcher a few times for the benefit of anybody that doesn't know, I'll give yeah. them a Flintstone definition. You can imagine that there's uh, two cameras and one camera is a close up and the other camera is what's called an establishing shot. And so you might open on the scene with an establishing shot, but whoever's manning the switcher, everybody can flick a button and move it to the close up shot just like that. That person's called a switcher. They're called different things in, in different um, environments, but I think that's what you're referring to, yeah? It is, um, actually. Oh, look at this, we have a demo. We got one right here. Um, this is the, the Black Magic A10 Mini Pro and it uh, came out uh, earlier this year. And uh, for $595, there are some amazing capabilities. I mean, that's this is almost, I mean, there's hold, TV hold it production up again quality in there. Hold it up again so we can see some of the buttons. Yeah, so. 600 uh, so, bucks. Yeah, so uh, these are all your um, your different inputs. There's four inputts. Yep. It's all HDMI. So, uh, yep. you know, most everything has an HDMI output. Uh, most camcorders nowadays have what's called a clean HDMI output. Yep. And uh, you can switch between all those inputs, um, do some on-screen graphic type stuff. Yep. Uh, so it's it's super powerful and uh, highly recommended. I, I noticed none of the inputs are labeled in the studio, in the recording studio. When we were recording music, they always put a old-fashioned Flintstone man, piece of scotch tape along the base of the board underneath the buttons, and you label it close up, establishing shot, uh, audience, right? Is that what you do? That's right. Yeah, we put tape on the bottom and, and you know, that ha also has a, um, a multi-view out uh, so that you can have up on another monitor, you can see all four shots at once. You can see the one that's on and the one that's about to go on. Yeah. And there's some audio levels and stuff like that in there. So you can yeah. make sure you're not blasting people's ears. You know, uh, one tip I would give everybody, and I appreciate you working with Stream of Consciousness uh, in my, this fairly unformatted interview. Um, one thing I always encourage people to do is take a walk and nobody ever does take a walk to the back of the room in the physical, uh, uh, at the physical event and ask the techs if you can have a quick peek at their setup. Now, when you do this the first 30 times, you won't even know what you're looking at. It would be look like walking into an ER at a hospital. You wouldn't really know. It's just stunning the stuff that's going on. But, but that's the start, everybody. It's becoming aware of the gear and what's possible and how many, oh yeah, and how many people do you need to do this? Oh, three, okay. And you start to, you start to understand what's happening. Um, we had talked about lighting a bit before uh, we pressed record today. Let's talk about this quickly because people can put this into motion right now at home uh, with their own Zoom setup. Um, you said you did theater in high school? Uh, AV geek, yeah. Uh, yeah. So these lights and the, yeah. these lights, the Fresnels and the key lights and all that stuff. Um, we we learned something early on called three point lighting, which you and mm -hmm. I briefly discussed before. We were just we were just comparing each other's setup, guys. Yeah. Um, that if you have a light in front of you to light the front of your face, it's this simple, and you have a light over here, and you have a light over here that's a different distance or a different wattage than this light. Then you create a little shadow on one side of the face, which makes you appear lifelike, right? That's right. Uh, is a big difference over than say just the one ring light, which is what a lot of people are using, I think, in a Zoom environment. That's so right. And I like. Go ahead. I was gonna say I like in your setup too. You got that neon light in the background to give a little bit of depth too. So um, yeah, that's yeah. a quick uh, everybody. That's just a quick ribbon light. Um, it looks like hell behind there because I didn't know what I was. I didn't know how I would use it when I bought it, but they're cheap. Um, and it changes colors and it changes intensity. I can make it move if I need to, which I usually don't. Um, I can I can complement the outfit I have on, which I didn't get, <laughs> obviously. But it, what that does is it pro provides what uh, photographers call, and Marshall knows this, depth of field. So the background isn't flat. 
like uh, here's my pet peeve, these artificial backgrounds, these uh, virtual backgrounds you're seeing on Zoom. I mean, everybody loves these things, man. You can't, you can't talk them out of it. <laughs> That's right. But I would I much see. rather see what's in the background. I see you're a reader. Uh, you got some red tennis shoes back there. Uh, the piece of art behind you is interesting. And, and I think if people look at my background, they maybe come in on the night uh, in shining armor or the books or the, the, the plants, you know, because what you're showing in the background indicates who you are as a person, if it's your office. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that's been one of the, one of the most interesting parts of this COVID is um, we've been able to see people in their natural habitats. You know, we've been able to see people <laughs> where they live. Um, I, you know, it was, it was really interesting uh, when this first started to watch Rotary President Mark Maloney doing a lot of things remotely. And it's like, oh, I can see, you know, where the RI president lives and I see a little bit about him. And it's always interesting, like you said, to, to see people and talk to them about what's in their background, because I think we've kind of lost some of that personal connection uh, because we've been absent being together. And yeah. so being able to make those connections with people through uh, their, their, their homes is, has been really kind of neat. So um, I, I am, uh, I completely agree with you in terms of don't use the virtual backgrounds. Well, it's kind of like a, a little bit of sleight of hand, you know, um, if you're not, if you're not in a, in a physical environment with somebody, because uh, I'm teaching sales online and stuff like that, you have to have a bag of tricks, just like That's you right. have a bag of tricks if you have production values at your event. You know, they're all designed to be more enticing, more attractive, keep people on the call longer. One of my favorite things to do, I've been doing a lot of keynotes on Zoom, is I look down in the system tray of the Zoom interface to see how many people are on at the beginning of my presentation. Right. And then I look again toward the end of my presentation to see if I lost anybody. <laughs> That's you right. Uh, because I'm interested in the numbers. And I think numbers tell the tale a lot. Uh, let's talk about numbers at a good event. You did a zone event recently. How many people attended? Um, I still haven't got the final tally. I know we had over 1,400 people registered. And I know we had people coming and going. And we were doing it through, the Zoom, uh, through a, a Zoom webinar. But we were also multi-streaming. Uh, to YouTube, to Vimeo, and to Facebook all at the same time. So uh, across all the platforms, I'm sure it was, you know, um, yeah, I, I think with, yeah, with, it's, it's, it's sometimes it's hard to say. I know there's some analytics that we can dig in and find it, but, you know, with online events, you're typically shooting for about 50% of your registrations. If you can get that, you're doing pretty well. Yeah, I was just going to polish that off for you, that if you had 14 registered, you can look for about 700 uh, to sign up, especially if they haven't paid. Um, one of the reasons we like registration for physical and uh, virtual events is because there's not only a psychological buy-in, there's a financial commitment, but it's hard to get people to pay for virtual these days. Uh, although I still recommend getting something. And, and this is, goes back to a psychological axiom called perceived value. That's that right. If you tell everybody it's a free event, they don't expect much. Why? Because of the same stuff Marshall and I have been talking about. Most people don't do much for, they don't give you much of a show for a free event. I read recently that one type of person has been getting huge dollars on Zoom uh, as a ticket. They're like the new Broadway magicians. Oh, They're wow. selling tickets to the entire family. They interact with the family. They have a lot of bells and whistles behind them. They have uh, production values. That's and right. The family is just so happy they spent the money because they got a fam they got an evening entertainment. Uh, uh, they were treated right. The magician had, turns out has actual skill, and these guys are knocking down some bank. It, I, mean, I haven't seen one of them yet, but I, I keep reading these great reviews that they've managed to keep Broadway lights lit at, at, during a pandemic. It's amazing. It I I it's been interesting to see how a lot of entertainers have taken their shows and, and, and brought them to Zoom and virtual events. I've seen a, a number of bands doing uh, personal events and, um, you know, live events on Facebook and stuff like that. So uh, I think that I, I need to look that up because that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so back to the numbers, 1400 register, 700 show up. Um, uh, what are you seeing online in terms of, uh, uh, let's call it hospitality? Um, I'm hearing about things like greeters. I'm hearing about uh, people uh, 
manning the help desk for people mm. in chat to get organized. Do you have a team that you work with? If so, how many people are on it? What's your preferred scenario? Yeah, sure. So we definitely have that um, kind of behind the stage type uh, team uh, moderating the chat, uh, warming up the chat. I mean, that's, you know, to get, again, um, get people excited, ask them where you're calling from or where you're participating from. And 100%. Um, if you go, if you go back and look at uh, some of our events from the zone summit, um, you know, guys like Jason Brown just knocked it out of the park, uh, getting the, getting the room warmed up, you know, through chat. Yeah. And so there's great techniques that you can use to, to really get people excited again, warm them up so they can receive that, that, um, that information that's about to be shared. But um, we also have, you know, the folks that, uh, are, are monitoring to make sure we keep the Zoom bombers out. You know, uh, if you don't have a first and last name, uh, if it's just, you know, Bob's iPhone, we're probably not going to let you in. Uh, so you need that sort of uh, firewall to make sure that you don't have any nefarious people uh, joining your event. And yeah, uh, yeah just uh, folks there that can support it. Folks are having any sort of uh, technical issues on the back end, uh, make sure that uh, you can help them out. Um, yeah. One of the other things that we did that uh, I think made it really helpful for folks is uh, some of these Zoom uh, links that you create are just horrible. Uh, you know, they're, you know, zoom.com slash and then about 30 or 40 characters. Uh, we used rebranded links. And so our official website was the summit of And so, um, or .org. So what we did was um, we created a branded link, uh, go.summitofchampions.org slash summit one, summit two, summit three. And so folks didn't have to remember that crazy Zoom link. They could just go to that Summit 1, Summit 2, Summit 3 link, and it was very easy to find. So we, we mitigated a lot of that challenge of going and digging into your email to find those links just by creating those rebranded links. And it also, uh, from a you know, production perspective, it was a uh, kind of a, a redundancy type risk mitigation technique because if anything happened to one of those Zoom links or one of those Zoom webinars that we set up and something went wrong, we could quickly regenerate a new Zoom link and rebrand it using that rebranded link and not have to worry about distributing it again because the only thing they saw was that rebranded link. So it yeah. protected us. If anything ever happened, uh, we could quickly on a dime spin up a new one and uh, not have to worry about sending the link out. So let's talk about this so people know exactly how to do this. I'm guessing you're using tiny URL or bit.ly or something to create that abbreviated link. We use the service called rebrandly and it's uh, I think it's, it's, it's free for um, maybe a, one or two domains and uh, you can create these custom domains, uh, rebranded domains. I think they have a higher version of the service for $29 per month where you can track where all your uh, folks are coming from. Yeah. But um you know, I use this a lot uh, down here in Zone 34. Instead of giving out these crazy links to uh, our Canva channel or Vimeo or some of our different channels, um, we just use like a rebranded link. And so it makes it very easy to off the top of your mind, just remember the link instead of uh, a, a very hard, complex link. Yeah. So, you, now, so is it rebrandly, R-E-B-R-A-N-D-L-Y? Rebrandly.com. And it's okay. a great service. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's break this down for people that may not be following. Yeah. Zoom typically generates a 30 or 40 character um, link. And this is because it's encrypted and they have their own formula for kicking out this, this link. And so in order for people to register, they have to uh, go to this link. Now, it's not a problem if all they have to do is click on something that's in an email. Although Marshall did say, sometimes you have trouble finding the email or whatever, but... Um, I thought it was brilliant the way that you're creating a brand. It could even be, say, the hashtag. That's right. Right, because now, now, now you're what, what, the whole thing here is to try to get people's brains, the synapses in their brain, to make connections so they don't feel like they're uncomfortable or out of out of touch. And if you can save them some problems from with the, with the help desk in the early part of the registration process, man, you're golden. Another reason to do this it occurs to me is you can't share the long ass URL that Zoom gives you anywhere except in an email. But your marketing campaign calls for uh, graphics on Instagram, JPEGs on Facebook, um, uh, the district governor's going around telling everybody to sign up. He could never read that crazy URL, but right. if, he, if, he can get, if he can just memorize 
the, the domain part of it, and then the, the what, what's called the rebranded part of it, what Marshall's calling the rebranded part of it, he could actually just spout it out, articulate it. If he says it 10 times, he has it memorized. Everybody right. would. And it was very easy because we did, we did the plenary sessions and then we had breakout sessions and uh, it was just, uh, you know, slash track one, slash track two, slash track three. You didn't have to remember all the different links for all the different events. Yeah. We had 17 breakout sessions. I can't imagine trying to create 17 unique Zoom meetings and getting everyone to figure that out. We just had uh, six tracks and um, people just bounced around from track to track. And it was so much easier to do it that way than it would be to create 17 unique um, uh, Zoom meetings. And to do the, the breakouts, you were using the, the breakout room uh, template or formula that Zoom provides? No, we, um, what we did was um, we had uh, uh, six tracks and each track had three um, breakout sessions in it, except one had two. That's where we got 17. And we just started uh, all of them at the same time at 10 a.m. and let them run straight through until 3 p.m. Didn't stop them and, and shut them down in between each breakout. Uh, again, because I didn't want to create 17 unique meetings. So we created six, let them go straight through. And um, again, at any point, if the, the tech that was running one of those breakout tracks inadvertently shut that one down, we could quickly spin up a new one yeah. and use that rebranded link. So it was a it was a kind of a redundancy type thing, but it was also to simplify the process. Instead of managing seventeen uh, breakouts, we had six. Yeah, lovely. It, yeah, um, you recorded the sessions. We did. All of them were recorded, and uh, we told folks that uh, they would be available within two hours of the session. And uh, here's the beauty of those rebranded links again. So within two hours of the end of each session. Uh, we had that recording with a fancy, you know, graphic uh, uh, thumbnail on it in our Vimeo channel uh, for them to watch. But we took that rebranded link that earlier that they used to get into the session. Yeah. Now, if they used it two hours later, they go straight to the recording. So they don't have to re remember a link for the recording. They just know Genius. I use this same link two hours later and I get to watch it again. Genius. Now you put it on a bunch of platforms. I always tell people when you're doing these events, you, you, you got to expand your brain, man. Too many people just thinking about the event in real time. But in today's day, day and age with social media and email and um, uh, even remarketing or rebranding, uh, not remarketing after the event is done, um, by making the recording available on different platforms, you get a chance to get more eyes. And if the content is really good, it doesn't matter if they see it a week later, two months later, three months later. In fact, if it was a really, it was a hallmark speaker, you could you could have bragging rights forever. But you have to content. create the recordings, and then you have to make the damn recordings available. I can't tell you how many times I've spoken and counted on the other person to record my stuff, and I never see the video again. And I was That's good right. that day. <laughs> You'll never know. <laughs> no, that, that's exactly it. And so much of this content, uh, it truly can be evergreen or it, it, it lasts for a while. Um, you know, I, I, I remember um, reading one of your blog posts recently and you're asking, uh, has anyone been successful in getting over 500 views for a video and stuff like that? And we've actually published some of our old webinars from the RPIC, Zone 34 RPIC team. And um, we, we still, I think we have nearly a thousand views on a lot of these things. Uh, I remember I had a conversation with you on, on something about hashtags and I sent you the link to the hashtag right. and that one has gotten a lot of content. I, I want to redo that one, but um, this content, a lot of times it, it can just, it, it can go forever. Yeah. Um, and yeah, if you, if you do good content, um, you definitely want to make sure that you capture that moment and can share it. Uh, because I mean, think about this, everybody, the whole reason you're doing the event in the rotary world is you're going to try to retain members, get new members, get money donated, right? T get people to take action, get people to sign up for something, right? If the video has the call to action contained in it, and it's easy, like in the show notes or the description, people can actually click a link, you'll have people signing up for rotary, donating to eradication of polio, signing up for events long after the event because the video is alive and well. But most marketing teams, they just give up, Marshall. They, even if they have good video, they don't push it out. They don't, they don't understand. 
I read one time that it takes McDonald's 7.5 impressions to sell you an Egg McMuffin. Wow. 7.5. Now, I don't yeah. know if the number's still good or not. But let's say it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless you're better at marketing than McDonald's, you're going to have to tell everybody about something 7.5 times before they actually take action on it. So once you get your head around this, you understand there's a success leaves trails, everybody. Listen to guys like Marshall Butler. He had 1,400 people register for his event, far more than 700 show up, and thousands of people seeing the video after the fact. That's Pretty it. cool. I love, I love the fact that you mentioned call to action. I see so many of these and they're just, they don't provide that logical next step for folks. Uh, we should always provide that next step that we want them to take in, in our events and our videos. Um, at the very end of our zone summit, uh, we had a call to action slide up there and it said, you know, take action, go to www.rotary.org. Because if, if you weren't a Rotarian and you're watching these inspirational speakers, um, we wanted you to, to find out what it takes to join this organization. Yeah. And so call to action is just, it's crucial because you've, you've got them there. Now you need to tell them what you want them to do next. Um, so often we just, we just let, we, we, we leave it up to them to figure it out. And uh, that's, that's not, uh, that's, that's, we call that friction and oh, yeah. uh, you want to reduce the friction. That's right. I tell speakers, you know, uh, look, everybody, if, if we just needed you to disperse information, we'd give everybody a brochure if, exactly. or send them to a website. We, we want your live personality because you have the emotional appeal to get people to take action right now. So don't forget to do this. It's called the CTA. Don't forget the CTA. It's don't very important. The CTA. That's right. I'm going to talk about security because it's still giving people problems. Uh, then I'm going to uh, come back to teams briefly and we can... Uh, talk about anything else you want to talk about. And then I want to yeah. show everybody a cool trick for that thumbnail that we, that you just talked about. Let's go back to security on zoom. I can't think of a company that has done more to improve its services during COVID than zoom. And it was pretty good before zoom started, but, but they realized what they had here, a near monopoly on online meetings, video meetings, if they could get their shit together on security, because the zoom bomber thing with the fear of God in people. Oh yeah. Most awful kind of porn would show up and uh, unwanted material <clears throat> and stuff like this. Uh, and, and people would be so shell shocked. They couldn't even continue the meeting. I heard stories about people just ending it for fear the guy would come in again. Right. Now they've done a lot to encrypt zoom and trick it out. But you mentioned some techniques that people still aren't using. And I, I can't for the life of me figure out why they don't insist on registration. You think that's oh a good goodness. idea. You mentioned first name and last name. Why? Well, we just want to make sure that, um, I mean, obviously we're not going to know everybody that's going to join, but uh, from what I've seen, a lot of these folks that are trying to get in that aren't, that may have some malfeasance in mind. Uh, typically they've, it's just some random unique ID that they've spun up and they try to join these things. It's pretty obvious when you see them. Um, and if, if they truly are not, if they truly have good intentions, typically they're going to say, "Oh, I'll just put my first name and last name in here." Um, if if they're if they are hesitant to do that, then yeah, there's no reason for you to join this meeting because yeah. you typically have something else in mind. So yeah, um, we 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 have moderators that are, are monitoring and and checking in that waiting room to make sure everyone and and they can chat with that person through the chat. You can only chat. You, there's ways in Zoom to only chat with the people in the waiting room. And uh, if someone is having difficulties, you can work with them. But um, yeah, if, if you want to get in, you're going to share your first name and last name. Yeah. So I know people are watching are saying, well, Hal, this guy had 1,400 registrants. How is he ever going to be able to check first and last name? That's not the point, everybody. Bad guys are lazy, notoriously lazy, and they certainly don't want to self-identify. That's right. Skeptics on the call thinking, well, why don't they just put John Smith? Well, they could, but at least now you're looking at him. Um, now you have, uh, I assume, a um, what do you call it? Uh, ejection seat, ejection button for people. Yep. What's your what's your uh, protocol for that? For for the misbehaviors? Uh, well, we really haven't. Knock on wood. Golly, I'm jinxed now. Uh, we haven't had an issue with uh, with misbehaviors. Um, uh, everyone has been behaved, and you know that's the other thing is a lot of times. Um, primarily, these issues come up if you're running a Zoom meeting. If you're running a Zoom webinar. Uh, you can 
absolutely make sure that people can't turn on their their camera and turn on their audio. So it depends on on how intimate I guess you want the event to be. Uh, we had a couple of events that uh, we really wanted people to have the ability to to interact during the session. So those were Zoom meetings. Uh, but for the the big events where we had fourteen hundred registrants, you know, you want to run Zoom webinar for that because at that point. Uh, the, the host and the people running the, the, the event have to make very conscious decisions to uh, promote you to a panelist or to a speaker to allow you to turn on your, your screen. So I think a lot of it depends, again, this all goes back to planning and the details. Uh, what is the intent of your event? And um, are you willing to let folks have that ability to turn on their camera? Yeah, and just, just to be clear, everybody, uh, the difference between the webinar and the meeting if your Rotary Club is doing a Zoom meeting, you're probably not pushing the link out publicly, which means that the only people that are receiving the link via email, usually in a bulk email, are club members or say club officers. That's right. But if you're doing a major event, certainly at the zone level, you have to broadcast almost the to get the link out. That means the nefarious people are checking it out and they could glom on to you. Um, but to uh, Marshall's point, the webinar, they're going to automatically turn off your video for sure, and probably your audio because there's audio. just not enough bandwidth to carry those signals. Whereas in the small Zoom meeting, you know, everybody's camera lights up if you've got your camera turned on. Um, so, so these are, are basic uh, rules to keep in mind. Um, yeah. uh, I have heard that if you get the occasional, and it's so rare now, especially if you have the registration process and you're encrypted and, and, and you're going with the webinar versus the meeting, um, that you can move people very quickly to the, uh, to a, um, what do you call it? A green room. What's, what's that called? Um, I, I know there's a way to, yeah, there's a way to, to block, to knock them back to the waiting, waiting room and, yeah. uh, and, and, and keep them out. So, and you know, yeah. it's, a, it's just a reflex. So if, if, if it happens and you don't have a plan, then those precious seconds, a lot of stuff can happen. But if you, if you, if you, have, if your team understands the protocol, okay, we see anything untoward, they're going to go to, I mean, they got their hand on the button all the time, right? Because yep. you, you, you have, like Marshall says, you have a plan. And there's some settings also where you can, once you kick someone out, um, you can block them from rejoining. So yep. uh, there are some settings within Zoom to make sure that it's not like a whack-a-mole. And uh, once you, you knock them out, they're done. Yeah. And, and so it's, what we're trying to say, I guess, in our own long form way is everybody, Zoom is a lot safer than it used to be. There's nothing to be afraid of. And by the way, everybody understands how this works. You know, it could happen in a public program too. Some idiot stands up and says, bark something from the audience about politics or something. Uh, and you have to go over and whisper in their ear. It's uncomfortable, but you should have a plan for it because it happens sometimes. I agree completely. It, 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 and it's probably easier to control in a, in a virtual uh environment. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's uh, close up with a comment about the team and the size of the team. I'm not sure I got an answer to my question earlier. So how many people oh. were on your tech team for the zone event? Um, so the, the core tech team, I guess, was a team of, uh, of three of us, three guys that um, I had, there was, I, I was in Florida. Uh, we had a guy in South Carolina and a guy in Virginia. And, um, and then uh, I guess th that was the team controlling a lot of the technology. And then kind of one step out was um, probably a team of maybe 10 to 15 folks that were either techs or monitors during uh, breakout sessions or uh, uh, Q and a uh, or watching the Q and a. So it probably got up to about 15 or 20 altogether. Yeah. Um, and what so the, what were the responsibilities of the three key people? How did you divvy that up? Yeah. So uh, what happened was I was primarily doing all the switching here in Florida and I was running it out of uh, my office, uh, my corporate office, uh, where we had great, you know, up, upload speeds. And I knew that uh, there wasn't going to be a guy out in the front yard with a backhoe that's going to cut my line and, you know, kill me. Uh, so I knew that was a pretty stable connection. But everything that I had on my computer in Florida, uh, I created a backup double of that and shipped it up to the guy up in South Carolina. So if I ever went dark, if anything happened to my connection, uh, he was able to immediately, he was essentially following along behind me and he could immediately start sharing and um, fire it up. So redundancy. We, we, we built in a lot of redundancy. When, when you're, again, when you are working with large groups and people are taking their time to participate in your event, 
uh, you want to make sure you think about all those small details and uh, don't leave anything to chance. Yeah. So you were the switcher. What did the other two guys do? Uh, so they were uh, doing a lot of the um, uh, monitoring. Um, the way that we were running it, um, essentially right now, my camera is um, is my feed. It's running through my camera. We had uh, all of the feeds for the computers and the screens and everything like that going to the switcher, which was then, uh, it was spoofed as a camera. And so I didn't have to worry about sharing screen. It was always, I would spotlight the camera to show the content that I wanted uh, for folks. And so um, Ken Dresser was doing a lot of work uh, from South Carolina, spotlighting the right speakers to make sure that uh, they were always on screen when they needed to be. And, um, you know, controlling, letting me know if the audio was coming through too hot um, and always ready to, to, to be the backup to take over if, if anything happened to my connection. And how, and were, then, you, how were you guys? Oh, sorry, yeah, let's do the third guy. Yeah. And so Andy up in Virginia, um, he's a fantastic videographer, uh, runs a video production company up there and uh, was just there to, again, provide any additional support. Um, if we missed any slides, any uh, uh, slides for a speaker or keynote, uh, he had access. We were doing we we create most of our graphics in Canva, uh, so it was really easy to to spin up a new uh, graphic and download it and, and pop it in. So uh, he had access to all the Canva accounts with all the templates and all the logos, and um, it just we wanted to make sure everyone uh, could could step in at any, at any given point. How did you handle comms with the team? So we were doing it mostly through uh, back channels on WhatsApp, and uh, that worked pretty well. Um, you know, sometimes you don't think about the most obvious things. And I was thinking the day after, I thought, you know, a couple of times things got kind of dicey. I probably, because I, I never had a speaking part, I was always, you know, the guy behind the curtain. I probably could have just called Ken and, you know, we could have talked through this and walked through it, but I was busy, you know, trying to, to click things and type messages and stuff like that. So, um, I mean, you know, hindsight, it's all gone. Just pick up the phone sometimes and, and talk too. Uh, is just as effective as uh, the back channel. I love these kinds of conversations because that's how new good ideas are generated. So you've got me thinking now. You've got the Air, Airbot, uh, AirPods in right now. You only need one of them for the microphone. So you take the other one out and you leave the connection open on the call for the entire session, just like the that's, professionals do, right? Because they're on right. the headsets. And then if, if they need to talk, they, cause you're not on mic, you're just that's right. on this mic on your, in your iPod, AirPod. That's and right. We were, we were was, never on mic. And I, as I think back on this and think of trying to, to uh, type out messages and, and switch, um, I probably could have just had a phone call with them and said, all right, click it now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, so, when you're, when you're in it, sometimes you, you just, you, I guess you over engineer it sometimes. No, and, no uh, extra sometimes charge for that tip. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> I, that's just like mind blown. I could have done the most obvious thing possible, uh, but we're, sometimes we're you go back and look. Other. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, this last little bit has been fairly technical, guys, and it's it's something that you most people listening won't be able to replicate. And, uh, but let's keep it simple for now. If you were adding one person to your tech team, I would add this greeter person, the person that can stir the drink inside chat to ask provocative questions, queue up topics, keep people thinking, and most importantly, greet the audience because we go into a lot of these Zoom sessions and it's like church. At one That's point, right. I said to one audience, I said, you people know each other because you're awful quiet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, if you have a lot of active chatter in your, in your chat, I think that is a great sign because that means people are engaged. They're paying attention. Um, we did run pre-roll leading up to the event. The first 15, the 15 minutes before uh, we were running some, um, some uh, rotary videos. We would put a countdown timer up. You know, the event nice. is about to start in yeah. 10 minutes. And so we, we had some, some things going to kind of get, keep people's attention. And uh, yeah, I, I, and I think a lot of folks naturally do it anyways. Um, hey, this is Bob from uh, Maryland. And so people were, were they were almost um, doing it themselves to a, a certain, especially in the subsequent sessions. Uh, people were like, hey, this is, uh, you know, and it was really nice to see people really engaged and having a good time. And you could tell that this, 
they had just the the buzz of the event had carried all the way through and people were really excited to be a part of it yeah i love it one of my uh, new favorite tricks you guys probably do it already is um when the speaker's announcing websites and um movies or a book that you've got somebody pulling up the url on amazon or netflix and then pasting that url into the chat because the chat can be recirculated as a uh, What's the, what's the abbreviation? A file. VLS, what is it called? Oh, I thought it came out as a text file. Or maybe text, TXT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're probably right. So, but, but hardly anybody ever thinks to share it because they think that, that that verbal stuff that was all exchanged wasn't important. And yet that was the nectar because, because so often people will say, well, I didn't get the link. Well, the, the, yeah. you don't want to have to listen to the whole one hour video again. Yeah. So you could actually, like, if we had chat in this, I would recirculate the chat. We, nobody was chatting today. Right. Uh, but so these are ideas, everybody, that would take your game to another level. And uh, Marshall Butler's the the master. Yeah, I don't know about man. the master. I'm, I'm I'm still learning, and um, you know, there's, I, it's funny that um, you talk about, you know, it's kind of like church because I do some of the AV stuff at my church too, and some of the the technology that I've learned um, is just stuff that churches are using and the reason why it works in rotary is because a lot of the folks running the stuff in churches are volunteers and aren't technical and so it's it's very it's very easy to use and it translates very well to rotary events because again you have a lot of volunteers that aren't super techie and um, can pick it up pretty quickly and so we've i've taken a lot of the technology that uh, we use uh, to create you know the things that you see on the screen at church and uh, dropped it right into some of these presentations. And uh, it works really well. One of, one of the tools is called Pro Presenter, And uh, you can queue up slides and videos. And um, it's, it's pretty powerful. And uh, it's pretty much the linchpin of a lot of what we do is, is queuing up all these videos and switching real quickly. What is it a kind of, uh, what is it exactly? Is it an app? Pro Presenter is an app. Um, it runs on the Macintosh and on, the, um, on, on Windows. And uh, you can create playlists of videos, of, of slides. You can, a lot of animations and, and uh, background graphics, lower thirds. Um, Pro Presenter is one. I know uh, some folks use things like QLab or uh, that's in the theater. A lot of people in theater use that for lighting and music and audio and video. Um, OBS is one that's used by a lot of folks. Wirecast. Uh, there's a new one called Restream that's pretty popular. Okay, so uh, there's just, some- Just so people understand, uh, in any given uh, event, you're gonna have a, a, a slide of the speaker and you're gonna have a, a, the name of the speaker as they begin their talk. And then there'll be a, a website that you can go click. And then there's a graphic and there's a video and you get all these things and they happen in chronological order. And you're saying that this pro presenter, you just queue these things up like in a punch list. Mm -hmm. And then somehow pro presenter is smart enough to insert whatever file program Graphic. You just um, you just click it and uh, you know because you're running it loaded. It's loaded. So I've got all the videos loaded. Um, I've got all the all the stinger graphics. You just click it and it goes up on screen. Click it, click it, and you can you know on to next if you want to just a play roll and you don't have to have to click them. Um, you just have them queued up and they run sequentially. Um, we use it to do uh, when we're doing live events. Um, you can load uh, music and sound effects. Yeah. Uh, Great. There's what's pro there's, there's, cost. Uh, I think it's maybe 350 bucks. Um, and it's a lifetime license. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's really inexpensive. And I know that, um, we bought a couple of licenses here in Florida for our, um, what some of our rotary things and we share it among some of our districts. So, uh, right. you can't have two people using it at the same time, of course, but we share it. And, uh, the great thing about pro presenter is, um, folks can be, uh, you don't have to have the licensed version to create content. You only need the licensed version to uh, present. So someone can have it installed on their computer and create all their playlists and then uh, share it with someone that has the licensed version. It takes a watermark off essentially. Right. And so it, it's really nice. So you can have multi-threaded, a lot of people working on something together and then it comes together and you only need the one license for the actual production. Nice. I'm trying to clean up after ourselves here uh, and not leave any terms undefined. You use. I'm terms. sorry. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I get yeah. Term stinger graphics. Tell everybody what that is. The stinger graphics are just those. Uh, here I am. Animation wipes or this, this, those, 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 
those graphics that help trans transition between maybe a slide to a speaker or a speaker to a video. A lot of times um, people will make stingers out of the logo um, it, it, to somehow reinforce what you're a part of. It, it just creates another production value, another, uh, it, it's, it's another interesting way to, to raise that production value for folks. Okay, very good. Uh, Marshall runs a company, everybody. It's called discovertech.com. Uh, discover, like it sounds, tec.com. They do a lot of web development, online marketing, uh, a few other interesting ventures. Uh, Marshall is a dedicated Rotarian. Uh, he, we, we've talked about the, the comparisons between church events and Rotary events. I always tell everybody, Marshall, that Rotary is my church uh, because uh, because. Um, it's, it helps me understand that the, the, so there's something bigger in the universe besides my giant ego and that I can go to Rotary once a week and put money in a basket and know that it's going to a good cause. Uh, there's just a lot of analogies. So if you are watching today and you're not a Rotarian, uh, please look into the group. It's rotary.org. You'll get a chance to hang around with people like Marshall Butler, and uh, it'll be one of the best decisions you've ever made. I promise you. There's your call to action, everybody. I got my CTA. Yeah. <laughs> so one more trick before we go. Uh, this is uh, something I trick, tripped on recently. It's kind of fun, and it 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 provides something that every video needs eventually, um, and that is the thumbnail. So I just asked the speaker mm -hmm. with me to do something like we'll, we'll do this. We'll, we'll spread our hands like this together. Go ahead, and then we might open our mouths like we're surprised, like oh. And when you do that, let's see, I'm going to have to figure out a way to do this. Oh, you know what I'll do? I'll go back and get the screenshot later. Oh, yeah. Just so pause then, it. Everybody, this can become the thumbnail that looks more interesting than two mates just looking at each other like this. <laughs> yeah, we can do two. So we'll do this first. Yeah. And then we go. Huh? <laughs> and who knows, uh, you know, which one will be better. But as I as I'm going through the video, I can stop it. I can do a quick screenshot of that. And then I can insert that as a YouTube title card. And I promise you, this will get a lot more clicks than Marshall's and my handsome faces. Uh, it's going to be close, but um, <laughs> we'll you're the see best. Works. Thank you so yeah. much for doing this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. Look forward to uh, seeing you again soon. Marshall Butler, everybody. DiscoverTech.com. See you, Marshall. See you, Michael.